I'm Angela Berger, and welcome to my channel. I cover missing person cases and true crime cases, so if that is something that interests you, please do subscribe. Today, I bring you the case of Wendy Eaton. This is an older case. It's from 1975, and actually the 46th anniversary of Wendy's disappearance was just a couple days ago on May 17th, 2021. And I want to talk about this case today because there has been some new information that came out and it has led investigators to reopen the case. So again, this is the case of 15-year-old Wendy Eaton, who disappeared from Media, Pennsylvania on May 17, 1975. Wendy Eaton was born on May 26, 1959 to Roland and Joan Eaton. She was the youngest of three children. She had an older brother named Richard and an older sister named Nancy. They lived near Media, Pennsylvania in a wooded area on Moccasin Trail. At the time of Wendy's disappearance, she was 15 years old and she was a sophomore at Pencrest High School. Wendy did very well in school. She was an honor student she looked young for her age, and she was also innocent for her age. Her interests were Girl Scouts. She also played piano, and she sang. Wendy was a very devout Christian, and she was involved in several different church groups. Her nickname was Wizzy, and her favorite TV show was The Waltons. Saturday, May 17th, 1975, was a beautiful sunny spring day. Wendy's parents and her brother were going to go golfing, so they invited Wendy to come along, and Wendy declined. She said that she would rather stay home and sunbathe. So as her parents were pulling out of the driveway, they saw Wendy. She was in her bathing suit, sunbathing on the roof outside of her window. And this was the last time that her family would ever see her. After Wendy's parents left, she called her best friend and she told her that she planned to go into town and to media to buy a birthday present for her brother. And it wasn't too far, so she planned to walk there. Several people, several witnesses, um, at least four witnesses, and one of her friends who drove by saw Wendy at 310 in the afternoon walking at the intersection of Indian Lane and Media Station Road. And then just 10 minutes later, so at 3.20, another friend came by and didn't see Wendy at all. When her parents got home, the house was empty. You know, they had expected Wendy to be home. Her bathing suit that she had been sunbathing in was left on her bed. And her father sensed that something was wrong. So immediately her family became, began looking for her. They tried to retrace her set steps to figure out where she might have gone. And when they didn't have any luck, they reported her missing to the Pennsylvania State Police. Pennsylvania State Police questioned all of Wendy's associates, her family, her friends. They searched a wooded area around Arrowhead Road and around Wendy's house. They brought dogs. The dogs tracked her scent to a fork in Arrowhead Road, but then they lost Wendy's scent. Two weeks before Wendy went missing, she had asked her parents if she could go to this religious meeting in Colorado. She really wanted to go because two of her good friends were going to be there. But her parents told her that she couldn't go, and she was pretty disappointed. Her parents thought, well, maybe she just decided to go and somehow get there without their permission. So investigators then went to this religious camp out in Colorado, and she wasn't there. So they were able to rule that out. In the years after Wendy's disappearance, someone from Pittston claimed to have seen her with a religious group called Forever Family. And this group was known to wear buttons that said, get smart, get saved. They were also associated with several missing children. Some of the members had been arrested in the Pittston area for blocking the sidewalks and roadways. Wendy's parents traveled 90 miles um, to investigate this, and they found no sign of Wendy. They passed out flyers to people who were local and asked if anybody had seen her, and no one had seen her. 
One of the things that Wendy's parents uh, had considered was that maybe she had joined up with a cult. There were lots of reports of cults in the media around this time. And with Wendy being so religious, they thought that this could be a possibility. They actually hoped that this was what had happened because the other likely thing that had happened um, was that she had been, you know, kidnapped, taken against her will. The family reached out to several different family organizations like Concerned Citizens Council on Cults. They reached out to other families whose children had gone to religious communes, but they did not have any luck with this. Around Christmas, the Eatons got a phone call and it was a man. He said that he would, he had Wendy and he would return her if the family um, gave him $10,000. So they got police involved and you know, they agreed to give, to bring half of the money to this park. Police staked out the park and ended up arresting a 16 year old boy. Um, he had been responsible for the call and it was a hoax. He had no knowledge of what had happened to Wendy. Wendy's parents tried very hard to get the FBI to take up the case. They circulated a petition and they got more than 1,000 signatures on it. They also reached out to local politicians. They thought that if they could get the FBI to take the case, that they would have better luck in solving it. However, the FBI ended up refusing to take the case because they said that they had no evidence that she had been abducted and because of that, there was no reason for them to take the case. Wendy's picture was put on milk cartons. The family hired three different private investigators to help in the case. The first one worked for three months but didn't get anywhere, so then they hired a second one. That private investigator um, basically just tried to take money from them. So, you know, it was very frustrating. Wendy's father, Roland, who went by Bud, he worked as a marketing executive at Sun Refinery and Marketing Company in Center City, Philadelphia, and his job would require him to travel a lot. So every time he traveled, he said that he would look at the airports to see if he could maybe find Wendy there. And then when he was at home on the days he didn't work, he would walk with the two dogs down in the streets around their house like I mentioned before, there were a lot of wooded areas, so he would just walk and look, keep an eye out on the side of the road to look for his daughter's body, which I think that is terribly sad. And the holidays were the hardest for the family. Um, her father explained if Wendy were alive and able to call on the holidays, she would. So that told him that Either Wendy was no longer living or she was in a position where she wasn't allowed or wasn't able to call her family. A local coroner looked at her dental records and compared them with the dental records of the victims um, from the Jonestown Massacre, but there were no, uh, no matches. Around this time period, there were several other teenage girls who went missing from the area but investigators did not believe that the case, those cases were connected to Wendy's case. Those girls hung out in the same area as a local motorcycle gang, and some of them had ties to the gang. And also most of those girls knew each other. So the investigators believed that those disappearances, and in some case, case of murders, were tied to this motorcycle gang, which was very violent. There was one case that Wendy's parents felt could have been connected to Wendy's case, and that was the case of eight-year-old Gretchen Harrington. Now, Gretchen disappeared from Marple Township, and Marple Township was about a 15-minute drive away from Media, which was the general area where Wendy disappeared from. So it wasn't too far. And also the circumstances were similar. So remember, Wendy is very into religion, into the church. Gretchen 
was the daughter of a minister, and so she was very involved with her church. Also, the circumstances of the disappearance are similar. So Wendy was walking to town in media as she disappeared from along the road. It was 9.30 in the morning on August 15th, 1975, when Gretchen was walking down a road to go to Bible school. So she was going to the Trinity Chapel Bible School. It was only about five blocks away from her home when she disappeared. And there was a witness who claimed to have seen this old beat up dark green pickup truck. It was missing the tailgate. And he saw a man inside and Gretchen was near this truck. It's like parked on a steep part of the hill going towards the Bible school. Now, you know, the witness did not see Gretchen interact with the man in the pickup truck or anything like that. He just saw the truck there and reported it because it seemed suspicious. And investigators were never able to track down the truck or the man who was in it. Okay, so then on October 14th, 1975, so a few months after Gretchen went missing, a jogger was running through a secluded, secluded area of Ridley Creek State Park when the jogger came upon the skeletal remains of Gretchen Harrington. Gretchen had been murdered by a blow to, to her head, which fractured her skull. So authorities believed that she had been murdered by a sex offender. The sex offender had been out of jail at the time of her murder, but by the time they found her body, the sex offender was back in jail. And I have not been able to find many more details on Gretchen's case. If you have any additional details, like if you know who the sex offender was, um, that would be great information to have. And we don't have, you know, the person wasn't convicted that I could find, so we don't know 100% sure if that is indeed what happened and that is indeed who is responsible. And I do see a lot of similarities I do see a lot of similarities in Gretchen's case and in Wendy's case. Wendy was a little bit older, but as I mentioned before, she appeared young for her age. So, you know, it could be possible that the two cases are connected. Now, earlier this week, so on May 17th, 2021, this case was reopened because new evidence came out and the evidence caused the authorities to can now consider this case a homicide case. And police conducted a new search in the wooded area on Indian Road. I'm sorry, the police conducted a new search in the wooded area on Indian Lane, which is one of the roads that is near, is near uh, where Wendy lived. And this would have been, you know, where she passed by on her walk to media. They were searching the woods near this house on Indian Lane. Unfortunately, Wendy's mother passed away in 1995. Her father, Roland, passed away from Alzheimer's disease in 2007. So very sadly, uh, they never got to find out what happened to their daughter they never got to see justice served, but Wendy's sister and her brother are still living and they want to know what happened to their sister. You know, they deserve to have closure. And I think at this point, you know, we don't know. The person who committed the crime, they could have passed away because this was 46 years ago. So a lot can happen in 46 years. The authorities haven't said if, you know, the people that lived in that house back in 1975, if they were considered suspects, they haven't give, given any information why they are now looking at this property and considering the case a homicide. They are keeping that information um, to themselves right now, probably to not jeopardize the investigation. So that is all we know right now, 
it is good to see that they're finally looking at this as a homicide and that after all these years, new evidence has come out. I really hope that it can be solved because 46 years is a long time for her siblings not to know what happened to her. You know, if indeed she was murdered, then they need to know what happened and hopefully she can be laid to rest, given a proper burial. At the time of Wendy's disappearance, she was four foot ten, and she weighed about ninety pounds. She has brown hair and eyes. She was deaf in her right ear. She was left-handed. She wore gold-framed glasses. So, I don't know. I think that likely, and this is my opinion, I think likely it was someone who was local to the area because. She wasn't taken from a main road. The road that she was taken from was surrounded by woods and it didn't really go anywhere but to houses. So there would be no reason for somebody to be back there unless they were from the area or unless they knew that that Wendy lived there. Um, we don't have any information about anyone like maybe stalking her, but we do know that she had been laying out outside earlier that day in her bathing suit so if somebody was washing the house they could have seen her they could have seen that her the rest of her family left and maybe you know they waited for her to leave the house if it was somebody who was local to the area kind of keeping an eye on things and that is when the abduction took place uh, i do believe that is what happened and i am you know, very happy that this case could soon have a resolution. So let me know, what do you think? Do you think it was somebody local? Do you think that there could possibly be a connection between this case and the case of Gretchen Harrington? I am very happy that this case has been reopened and that there seems like there could be a good chance of it finally being solved. After 46 years, certainly hope that Wendy Eaton can get justice and at the very least that we can find out what happened to her and she can get a proper burial and be laid to rest. Anyone who may have any information about this case should contact the Pennsylvania State Police at 215-452-5216. And I would like to hear your thoughts. If you have thoughts about this case, do you think it was someone local? Do you think it could be tied to the case of Gretchen Harrington? And if you enjoy spreading the news about missing people and hearing about true crime cases, please subscribe to my channel. I do try to post twice a week and I will see you in the next video. Bye.